I'm Nigel Rennie. Uh, I'm here to be the moderator for the next two days and I'd like to welcome everybody this morning for being part of our uh, annual, which is now an annual webinar series. Um, thank you very much to Syngenta for sponsoring today and for that introduction by uh, Matt Legg. Um, I'm here in the uh, All Turf uh, audio studio with uh, our technical specialist, uh, Logan. We welcome you and look forward to you hearing your talk today on uh, Managing turf grass insects, you always have a lot of uh, insights to provide to us, and uh, we'll get to the questions at the end. So uh, uh, thanks, uh, Ben, and uh, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Nigel. And what we're going to talk about today are, you know, a couple of things. We'll recap uh, some issues that we've had in the last couple of years. And, of course, I haven't been able to get to Canada since uh, the world shut down in March 2020, almost two years ago. Uh, and so this is a lot of you know, kind of north, northern North America uh, issues that we're dealing with, the pests on the rise, but also uh, some of the communications that I get from people in Atlanta, Canada, as well as in, all the way out to Ontario. So it's mostly uh, the eastern half of Canada that we're going to talk about, which is very similar to what we have here in Pennsylvania. We're really blessed with a lot of pests, and some of those pests are, are moving north. So we'll talk about what uh, has happened and what I uh, expect to uh, happen in the future. We've got a lot of changes going on here in the U.S. as far as pest control uh, kind of controls and compounds possibly going by the wayside. Uh, those effects are also being seen in Canada as well. So we'll talk about uh, really the impacts of the deregistration of a couple of products. Uh, and it is kind of a boom time for turf insect control, at least with chemicals. Our industry partners have been busy uh, for the last decade or so. It takes a very long time to bring these um, products to market. I think longer than fungicides and herbicides uh, because of the nature of insecticides. But uh, we're really experiencing a great period in insect control as far as new products coming to the market. And what we can see, um, it has a, there's a little bit of confusion in the marketplace about how these products can best be used. So we'll cover that as well. Then we'll conclude on you know what I think the future of turfgrass insect management is, and I think Canada uh, leads the way in many regards in this area, which is biological and biorational control options. Uh, it's something that our lab is, has worked on for a long, uh, long time, and I think um, the, the timing is right for many of these products to uh, take on a bigger share in the marketplace. So. Last time we uh, were all together at the national show, we were 2018-19 recap uh, that were incredibly wet and wild years. And moisture as well as temperature is really what flares up insect pest problems. Uh, so this period of 18-19 were two of the wettest that I've ever seen. And in that following spring, that start to the pandemic uh, was no different. And really why this is important, especially in the springtime when we have these really warm and wet years as insects can really ramp up their activity much earlier. Moisture is vital uh, to the success of some of these insects, whether or not their eggs survive or possibly even whether their larvae go undetected. So my big pests on the radar based on this three years of really kind of increasing pest densities going into 2021, were annual bluegrass weevil, which is uh, you know the number one insect pest on golf courses in the eastern half of North America now. It continues to spread into new areas, and that spread continues throughout Canada. Uh, I was expecting that to be a big, big year. It does seem uh, that its biology is tightly correlated with moisture, although we will know more about that in, uh, based on some of my students' work in the laboratory in the next couple of years. Leather jackets or European crane flies, uh, we are well aware of the associations with moisture with these insects. And, uh, you know, in Canada, it's been a, a problem for quite some time in Ontario. Uh, and we're starting to see it spread into other locations as well. It's really even spreading here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And then chinch bugs, which are, man, I never thought I'd be dealing with chinch bugs in my lifetime. But everyone seems to get all hot and bothered about chinch bugs. And what we have seen is really an increase in chinch bugs maybe not necessarily due to environmental conditions, but uh, the fact that we see greater of adoption of more selective insecticides. So we'll talk about that as well. So it was you know, looking pretty good. Um, my successful year is counter to your successful year. So if you have destruction and all of that, that's, that's not really good, but I need, I need insects 
to do their thing so that I have some value in this world so that I can continue on with my career. I just need to make it like 18 more years. So, and it was looking good out of the gate. This is residual chinch bug damage. And what I mean by that is what we typically see with the hairy chinch bug is this insect has multiple generations per year. It really takes until that second generation comes through that the population is built up into big enough densities that we start to see turf collapse in areas like fine fescue native areas on golf courses. Uh, we can see it often, an uh, awful lot of times in home lawns. Uh, so this is in Pittsburgh. And we went out to this area that was just not greening up. And this is something that I would recommend for all of you in the next couple of weeks, once we have uh, the snow receding, to really check these areas that are matted down brown. It's, it, you know, to the layperson, this could be uh, very easily overlooked as just, you know, that's kind of what uh, fine fescue areas look like. We can also see damage uh, to Kentucky bluegrass surrounds. Uh, so it's not just a fine fescue pest, but we really do see a lot of damage in these areas. So I was looking good, collected hundreds of thousands of chinch bugs from this area. It's feeling pretty good. Even leather jackets seem to be on the rise, which is one of the coolest pests out there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping this one establishes in more places because it's such a great pest to work on. And I do have a student who is working on the biology and behavior of this insect. And we do have two species of the leather jackets that are problematic, both invasive from Europe. However, only one of them really seems to be super traumatic, and that's the European crane fly, Tipula pallidosa. This one is much more localized in its geographical distribution. And what we're seeing is with excessive rainfall that we've had in the last couple of years, now it's able to kind of spread out a little bit further. That spread is slow unless we're moving it around in sod or something like that. But I think this one will become a bigger and bigger problem, especially given the amount of rainfall that we have at key times in its life cycle. So we were seeing a lot of vertebrate damage and, and it wasn't white grubs, but European crane fly in there. So looking good on those fronts as well. But the real big disappointment, and unfortunately, this is probably 85% of what our laboratory does. We're, we're heavily invested in this insect is the annual bluegrass weevil. We collect thousands and thousands of adults for trial work as well as laboratory studies. And so we're out here vacuuming, collecting multiple people eight to 10 hours a day. It's why I have constant ringing in my ears, even though I wear ear protection. We were surveying for this insect all over the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and not really coming up with much. So there was a real bummer there and it was really counter to our hypothesis that it would be a big annual bluegrass weevil year. The good thing is, and this is the value of sampling, as I say on this slide, is if we're scouting and we're not finding a whole lot of adults, it was nice to know from the management side of things, from your end of things, if we're not finding a whole lot of adults, uh, and, and we're putting the effort into sample and being consistent about it, it's nice to know that that actually leads to low larval counts in untreated areas. So in many of the cases, um, you know, and we consult with some pretty high valued golf courses, high end golf courses, um, you know, where we really reduce the amount of spraying that we did for this insect pest based on the scouting that we were doing. So a good thing from your end of things, Kind of a bad thing from my end of things uh and really here's to illustrate the absolute collapse that we saw in populations across pennsylvania um here are you know multiple trial sites that we have in the center of pennsylvania uh where we have these untreated areas within our chemical efficacy trials so that we can evaluate how a product a new product might work uh, so the areas that we leave untreated in 2020 had 120 to 100, uh, 110 to 130 larvae per square foot that's pretty dense we're going to see damage at about uh, a third of that um, you know these other places had lower densities but very very consistent consistent densities those same trial areas what we saw in 2021 went from you know well over 100 larvae per square foot down to eight some of these other places you know maybe a one larva per square foot to 30 larvae per square foot that's really not going to help us out as far as determining whether a product works when we have very low densities. So kind of a kind of a crappy year for the McGraw lab as far as ABW goes. And, and unfortunately it's a big part of what we do. So, you know, what is really driving this? We've talked a lot about the environmental conditions over the last couple of years. In all my talks that I give, we were so much about forecasting insects, 
and that forecasting insect problems really ties into weather. But are we just becoming better educated? I think you know the amount of education that we've had, especially during the pandemic, I think that has been one of the good things about the pandemic and all these virtual talks, is we can get a lot of information. Uh, I think products are becoming much, much better at controlling these insects. So I think that it, it's, you know, it's part of the market is improving. What's becoming uh, coming to the market is is better than what we've had. We're losing some old products that were eh, kind of mediocre in some regards. Uh, but this is something that we'd want as educators to get that information out there. And then year after year, you're slowly reducing the population or culling the herd, as I would like to call it. But at the same time, we can't discredit Mother Nature. And sometimes she does give us an assist in the insect world. And what we have on the slide here is the collapsed egg, annual bluegrass weevil egg. We really don't know, even though it's our biggest insect pest that we have on golf courses in many places in Eastern US, we still really don't know the impact of the cycling dry to warm areas. And what we saw in the beginning of spring of 2021 is really dry periods right around egg laying. We know how that affects some of our white grub species. Uh, it's, it stands to reason that it could impact these populations as well. So we're gonna have to wait a couple of years for some extremely sh sharp uh, graduate students to figure that uh, question out. So it wasn't all doom and gloom. If I had known that there was gonna be some great rainfall coming in our summertime, I think I would have been uh, a little less depressed during June. But what we saw and what I'm showing you here is the historical average of rainfall that we have at the Penn State campus. And the gray bar really shows you the accumulated uh, rainfall by month that we received in 2021. So well, well above uh, that normal summertime average that we have here in central Pennsylvania. And this was the case in many places in the eastern U.S. is that we saw not only uh, what we typically see is these huge amounts of rainfall, especially in the fall time that we did receive, you know, eight, almost nine inches is ridiculous. Uh, but really this wet weather through the summer when we're going to have higher than average temperatures that we've observed in the last, you know, however many years, that's really going to accelerate a lot of insect growth and a lot of insect problems. More particularly, it's really going to flare up, or it, we predicted that it would flare up white grub issues to a great, great extent, mostly because our two biggest insect pests that we have that are white grubs, Japanese beetle, Oriental beetle, they are very, very much water-loving insects. They're going to seek out only moist areas. So sometimes in dry years, we have bad white grub problems with these two species because we're irrigating fairways and we're really reducing the amount of area uh, that these insects have. So they all kind of congregate in these really moist areas or places that we're irrigating appropriately. Uh, and what you would think is in a wet year, their populations would explode because the beetles can put their eggs everywhere uh, in the environment. There's really no limitation. So that might have been one of the reasons that we had a pretty poor year for white grubs. Or they just dispersed their eggs in a greater area. So this is um, what we collect our beetles in are these pheromone traps. So Japanese beetle, we can buy a pheromone lure, put it on a trap. And then every night when it's about peak, we're filling these traps up with beetles. So there's you know 3,000 beetles in this trap every night from every single trap. They're basically flowing out of the top when we're at peak. So that's what we would expect in a normal year. Uh, this is probably four or five traps uh, that we filled up in a sweater box here that we dump in. And then we can take those beetles and seed them into our trial areas so that we get very consistent grub densities for uh, examining our, our efficacy trials. So here is Audrey Samard, my, uh, one of my PhD students. Uh, and she's showing you the results from about 15 to 20 traps in a night during peak flights. So we absolutely saw an entire collapse of Japanese beetles as well. I, there could be some biological explanations. There could be some biotic impacts from uh, predators or parasitoids, but more likely it is probably somewhat environmental. There's fewer beetles flying around. That could be an effect of the previous year. We just really don't know. So it was a very, very light year for most people as far as Japanese beetle. But 
when we have a light year from a couple of beetles, there are other beetles that will take its place. Most of you on this call um, probably uh, deal with the one on the right hand side, the European chafer. This is kind of a newer, uh, and I say newer in air quotes, uh, for the Maritimes as well as Ontario, places like Vancouver are experiencing this insect. What we're seeing is a real decline in European chafer. We used to be able to find European chafer in Pennsylvania, but as summers are getting warmer and warmer, this European invasive is pretty much migrating north until it gets into environments that are more similar to its native distribution like Europe. So I do expect this one to become even more, if that's possible, and some of you are really heavily battling European chafer, become more of a problem in uh, places like Ontario, Quebec, and even into the Maritimes. This insect is a little bit more traumatic of a, a grass damager than our other white grubs because its behavior is slightly different. It will feed much later into fall and much earlier in spring. There's even some evidence that it will feed under snow cover. Um, it, it, the grub resumes feeding much earlier than the other white grubs. Uh, the one on the left is northern mass chafer. That's um, pretty similar uh, in some regards. It's really not overly apparent flying around during the day like Japanese beetle. And both of these two insects really uh, have the ability to oviposit or lay eggs into really dry turf. So we see it in unirrigated areas as well. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the bad news for Canada. Um, it's probably the good news for Pennsylvania that we have just one less white grub species that we're dealing with. So I'd expect this one to be on your radar. Another one that I get asked about quite a bit, uh, even with our friends in Ontario, is what about fall armyworm? Uh, people absolutely lost their friggin' minds with fall armyworm. And, and this is my second to last talk that I have to give in the winter season. I'm sure everybody's sick of fall armyworm as much as I am, but it was a spectacular insect outbreak in many places in North America. But the question that I get from my Canadian friends is, is this something that we should be concerned about? leading up to kind of the invasion this year or is this something that we have to worry about in future years the great thing about fall armyworm is it cannot persist any place where we have a hard frost so canada whatever you experience and i think it was pretty light although some places in southern ontario might have experienced uh, some issues this year um, in my home state of maine and northern maine we've experienced fall armyworm so i think new brunswick even into Quebec could experience these in boom years. And this was a big boom year. But we start fresh every year with the fall armyworm because the frost comes in, snowfall, it's gonna just smoke out any stages of fall armyworm that is out there. And that's because it's a tropical insect. So the only places that this insect can really reside or persist is in Southern North America. So in Southern Florida, Southern Texas, those are the only two places in the US where we have consistent populations or year round populations. What happens is the moth gets up in the jet stream and can be carried as much as 500 miles in a single night. She will plop down, she will lay eggs, they will go through their complete generation and the, the insects that survive to adults get up in the jet stream and they get carried further north. So in the South in Florida, we might have consistent year round continuous generations. In the Carolinas, we might experience two to four generations per year. In Pennsylvania and areas north like Canada, we're really only gonna experience one generation per year. The last time that I had seen an outbreak, um, and it really wasn't even as big as this, uh, but it was a severe outbreak, was in Buffalo, New York. So Niagara area, I don't see why that wouldn't be a problem, um, you know, in those boom years or what, it would be a problem, not my problem. Uh, but it, it, that was 2011. Uh, so it does happen infrequently. There is some evidence that what's happening in the South is that we're having major pesticide failures there, that it's contributing to a larger population moving further north. Also, if we have more extreme uh, weather events, more storms earlier in the year, this could be a bigger problem, at least for Southern Canada. So the weird thing about this year is this insect is usually brought up in hurricanes, which usually in a normal year, whatever that is, uh, occurs at the end of August into September. And then we have a frost 14 days later. So it's a non-issue. 
What we saw in Pennsylvania this year was that moths were arriving very, very early. We have some monitoring sites across the state for corn, and those sites were picking up really an explosion of moths by early August. What we had seen in our trial sites for white grubs is we were detecting caterpillars that of a pretty good size in mid-July, meaning those moths arrived probably at the end of June. If that's the case, there's plenty of time for these insects to complete a generation and then make it up to Canada. But the real concern is their feeding behavior. These are really traumatic, traumatic feeders. Uh, they feed in packs. That's where they get their name, army worms. Some people would say it's their green army stripe. But there are several species of army worms that will just decimate turf overnight. This one, uh, this is a baseball field that got taken down in about 24 hours. This is from the common army worm. This is something that definitely is in Ontario, has the ability to persist um, in the through the winter time, so it doesn't have that tropical status that the fall army worm has. We expect to see this damage in June. So something to keep an eye on that, um, you know, army worms are fairly easy to control. Uh, but some of the the, the timing kind of uh, catches us off guard and damage can happen really quickly if we don't have controls in place. So what I think for Canada, for the most part, uh, I'm not too, too concerned. I am concerned that there's a huge population of moths in the south that are going to lead to these huge populations further north. I don't think that our storm and our, our current environment uh, or environmental conditions, climate conditions, uh, bode well either greater storm activity earlier in the year has the potential for this to become a pest in Canada. But for the most part, I, I think we're good in many cases. And just to ease your minds, I made this flow chart about how I would approach fall or moving worm if I was a Canadian. So I would say the one good thing about social media is that we learn a lot about our jobs. And I use social media um, probably a little too much one of the good things that I use social media for is seeing what's happening uh, for pest activity to the south of me. For these insects that migrate or insects that emerge in spring, I can learn a lot by seeing what people are doing on social media. So are people in the U.S. losing their minds in the insect world? Uh, we, probably they're losing their minds in many other ways. If they're not, then you're good. You're, you're going to have plenty of fair warning in Ontario. If people are going crazy in 2022 about army worms and they're destroying turf all over there, I would first ask you, are you using a cell print for grub control? And I would say Matthew Legg and his colleagues are probably selling a lot of a cell print because we got a, a ton of testimonials that look like this. Now, why I ask about grub control is we're typically not applying a cell print unless you're a farmer in Georgia who deals with fall army worms year round. But you're not applying a celebrant for fall armyworm. You're most likely applying it for its grub activity. And what we saw is tons of these testimonials. Death on one side, a celebrant treated area, totally clean from these insects. And as I mentioned, these insects are really, really easy to control. So the thing about a celebrant is it has an incredible lengthy residual activity. So what we're doing is we're putting down eight fluid ounces or 0 0.6 liters per hectare. In April, if it's a granular, or probably May in Ontario, or if it's a liquid, we could probably even go up into July. But the point is we're putting down these very low rates very early in the year, and that is persisting long enough to get caterpillars that might show up at the end of August, or in this case, this year in July. The caterpillar rate is even lower, 0 0.15 liters per hectare. So if you think about that product breaking down, that's all we really need to have in the system when these caterpillars show up. So if you've got that, you're good. And that's what we saw. Um, we see a lot of homeowners, uh, lawn care operators in the mid-Atlantic, like Maryland, Delaware, calling me like, I left on a Friday, it was green, came back to the house on Monday, and it was dead. And we asked, you know, what do you use for grub control? You know, imidacloprid is an excellent grub product. Um, you know, we don't know how much longer we're going to have it, uh, but it is an excellent, excellent grub product. It just doesn't have that caterpillar control. And those are usually the two big uh, products that we see for use for grubs here in the U.S. All right, so if you didn't apply uh, a celebrant for grub control, I would ask you, do you care whether or not fall armyworm rips up your turf? And you might think, well, 
taking this webinar. Of course we care. And I only bring that up because even though this insect feeds in pack, we see 80% turf loss in three days, the recovery is really good. If you look in these areas and you dig down in the turf, you see a lot of green pushing through. So I took this photo on September 8th. I was playing golf with two professors from the business department. Massive destruction all across our home golf course. They did not notice it. I was like, you guys are gonna be in textbooks. I'm, you know, get in this picture. They had no idea. They just thought it was irrigation. And what we see uh, 10 days later in that same area is it pushes right through as long as we have ample rainfall, which we had plenty of rainfall or irrigation to these areas, it will push right through. The other thing I would say is that this insect typically damages from the outside in. So it's gonna be hitting rough. I've never seen any short turf uh, being damaged, but home lawns, athletic fields, roughs, those are the areas of concern. All right, so if you don't care, um, you're good. If you do care, I would say then we need to do a little bit of scouting. So the social media can be the passive way of scouting that you do in your free time, but really going out and surveying for things like eggs. And I think a lot of uh, my Canadian friends were able to find eggs and, and track those eggs and to see whether or not those were going to be problems. Uh, you know, the caterpillars would be the next. But eggs are a great way to understand whether or not you have these pests. And it's really one of the only insects that I can think of that where we say go and scout for eggs because they're very, very tiny, but it's about the behavior of the insect, where they're gonna place those eggs that makes them really easy to detect. So what a, a single female has probably laid all these egg masses on this flag. Uh, that seems to be a very, very common place for these moths to lay their eggs. So they lay them up high, probably to get them away from predators like ants. They'll hatch out, drop down, and start feeding on the turf. So we'll see this at nighttime. Uh, the, the female will come in, she'll lay them on the flags. Uh, if I'm uh, managing a, a park or an athletic field, I often find them on goal posts, you know, so soccer posts, uh, sometimes in the netting itself, that's a little bit harder to see. Occasionally, what we'll see in the home situation is, um, you know, they might glue their eggs onto the side of the house or on a on a porch or something like that. Something that's going to be elevated a little bit. But the flag is a great way uh, to really you know, scout these things. So you got basically 18 plus uh, or nine to 18 uh, little scouting stations that you have on a golf course. The next thing too would be, you know, just because we saw eggs, and I think this was the case in lots of places uh, that I heard about in Ontario, is that. People saw eggs, they monitored the eggs, and they waited to see if they saw caterpillars or we were waiting for a frost to kill off the caterpillars using a, a soapy solution or a disclosing agent, which doesn't have to be precise, just squirt some um, dish soap into a bucket of water, apply it over the turf. If there are caterpillars in there, they will immediately shoot up. There, it does not take very long. These caterpillars will go to the very end of the plant. Uh, the only concern that I have with this is on short turf, which you know, these insects might be cruising through the short turf, but we really want to be uh, irrigating off that soap so that we don't get any scald or burn on that turf. So again, where I would be looking though is from the edges. It could be because the moth gets blown into an area up against a building and they drop down or like a wood line on a golf course. Those are the areas that I'd be looking in rough. Uh, you know, the final thing too is if you see caterpillars, um, you know, if we have these early arrivers and they have enough time to get to a size where they're going to cause serious damage, they are very easy to control with just about any contact insecticide. You know, I would probably recommend a pyrethra. It seems to be a very effective, um, you know, kind of better ecotox profile than some of our other products, but, you know, just do the standard caterpillar control, which is make that application light, late in the day, don't mow it off, put it in with a light carrier volume, try not to uh, disturb that area, and you'll get some very good control. They actually die in a really nice way. They get really crispy like this. So what we want to do is if we are treating for these caterpillars, and the same thing for cutworms, is we want to keep that residue up in the area where they're feeding. So other than that, you know, even with late instar larvae, recovery is good. As you can see from this photo, there's lots of green in that canopy that's just going to push right through. So that's kind of my recap of the pests and what I think are going to be uh, big on the horizon. I think it was an exceptional year for the turf grass managers that I deal with. Unfortunately, that's counter 
to the success of my laboratory. So uh, I give us a D, maybe even a D plus because we did put a lot of effort into it. But really, it was an A plus year for our turf grass managers. So now we're going to shift gear and talk a little bit about Canadian insecticides. Uh, there's some definitely some changes coming down the pipeline. I think there's going to be some consistent turning over of things. Uh, we're probably going to ping pong between the loss of some products and the gaining of other products. Um, seems that uh, the U.S. is overdue for some of these products to be lost as well. And we're feeling your pain with some of these. But the biggest news, um, I think, on this winter talk circuit that I've been doing uh, here in the U.S., which is the same in Canada, is that we're going to be losing chlorpyrifos. This is an older chemistry. You know, this has been around since the 50s, 60s. Uh, it's an organophosphate, has a harsher ecotox profile, if you will. Uh, what I was told is that December 10th of 2022 is going to be the last sale from retail. Uh, last date of use will be through 2023. Um, so there is some time to transition away from it. I think what we see in the U.S. as well as Canada is that I think, really, I think that this impact is going to be minimal. Uh, there are some certain cases where there is going to be a loss, and that might be a little bit moderate. But what do people typically use chlorpyrifos for? Um, you know, here in the U.S., I know a lot of people use it for uh, turf grass ants. Uh, this is a contact insecticide, so the use of this product to control ants is only going to kill the workers on the surface. Some evidence for these insects sensing the residue. It's a you know, it doesn't have a great smell to it. Uh, and just staying in their mounds until that product wears off a couple of days later and then they resume. So it's not what I recommend for ants. Um, in Canada, you have clothianidin. Uh, it's called arena here. You have pyrethroids. Um, I believe scimitar is available for you as well. You know, a combination of those products when we first see ant mounding is still my top recommendation shuts down the workers and it takes a little while to knock out the colony but that slowly ramps up at about 30 days so you get immediate satisfaction and reduction of mounting and then this slow and steady decline in the mounting so chlorpyrifos in this situation i don't think is a a great great use leather jackets uh for the few of you on this call who probably deal with leather jackets um i i do know that people try to use uh chlorpyrifos um i think it's only provides moderate control of the leather jackets in the springtime i don't think we get very good control of leather jackets and with really any product in the springtime uh that's on the market at, at the time my recommendation here would be a pyrethroid it happens to be the cheapest products that we have here in the u.s uh but the timing is something that we typically don't think of, which is in fall. So the fall, we're thinking about shutting down the golf course. Uh, and this is the time that leather jackets are probably uh, the, the best timing for control of these insects. So we typically think about managing leather jackets when we have damage, which is February to May, depending on what species we have. So if it's the common crane fly, we might pull the covers off of greens and see some damage in there. These insects can feed. They don't go below the, the frost line like white grubs do. They feed right in that root zone. So when we see the damage, we're thinking about controlling it in springtime, but this is when both species are really large bodied insects and you're not gonna get great control. So really shifting your mindset into looking for flights of these insects and then targeting them with a contact insecticide right around egg hatch, which takes about 10 to 14 days. We don't wanna be situation where we're trying to control these large bodied third or fourth instars in springtime. So chlorpyrifos in this case, um, I'm okay seeing it going because we have uh, some better alternatives. I'm about to get on a plane to go to England on Saturday and talk some people off the ledge because they don't have any products really uh, for curative control of uh, in uh, leather jackets. This is the big one that I think where we're going to feel the loss of chlorpyrifos is annual bluegrass weevil management. And I do think, uh, you know, it's good to rotate insecticides. We only have uh, two adulticides, we're basically pyrethroids, which is much better uh, than a chlorpyrifos, or we have chlorpyrifos. Uh, and where people typically use chlorpyrifos for annual bluegrass weevil management is that rotation 
but also if we have pyrethroid resistance. Um, I'm not overly well aware of any suspected resistance issues in Canada. I think we have fewer generations of this insect there that helps out a great deal. Um, I don't think we're in the, the US mindset of, of uh, intense spraying for this insect pest in many places. So we want to keep resistance out of Canada. Um, but, you know, as far as rotating between the pyrethroid or clopyr phosphor adult management, those effects will be real. Now, a lot of people would say, you know, we've got a bunch of larvicides for this insect. Why control adults at all? And my thought is this is a very important time to control the insect. It's very important to control the adults because what we're trying to do is reduce the number of eggs that become larvae. We want to we have one stage present in springtime in a couple of weeks. These insects are going to be walking out all over the place. It's the one time that we can target them with a contact insecticide and have a big impact on that potentially damaging stage. The other reason why we want to control adults is we want to really compress that egg laying window so that we don't have a jumble of stages. This is going to happen in the summertime. It makes summertime control very, very difficult, but we don't want to have this situation out of the gate in springtime where we have first, second, third, and fourth instars. This is all from one cup cutter sample. So when we have these overlapping stages, we have to realize that we have some insects that are going to be inside the plant. So that photo was taken uh, at the end of May from one of our trial sites where we did nothing, we left it untreated. And if we have stages that are inside the plant, like the first and third instars, then we have some stages that are out of the plant, fourth and fifth instars, and they're actively feeding on the crown. That's a problem. Uh, later in a couple of weeks later, we might have some pupae in there. We have a bunch of stages that no matter what we apply, even the best products on the market, are not gonna to touch those insects. So really the only stages that we can control are the insects that are exposed in the soil. So we might put something down that is taken up by the plant, but we're really putting it in the plant to get them when they feed on the crown, or we could go with an adulticide against the adult. So that's really kind of why I think we need to have adulticides in there or the value of an adulticide. It's just that now in Canada, and the US, we have a similar uh, deregistration timeline here in the US for chlorpyrifos as well. Now we're down to one class. And that one class, we have pretty widespread resistance throughout in the US. And it's really all budgets of golf courses that deal with resistance. So it's not just uh, people who have abused uh, this insecticide at high end golf courses. So we need to make things work better that we have. Um, and one of the things that we have looked at over several, several years now that's, um, you know, kind of transitioned into other things, but uh, many of you are aware of the work that we've done with Civitas. So uh, this really unique product uh, that is primarily used uh, for disease management and activating plant defenses. We have seen that oils like Civitas uh, can have some direct mortality of the insects. So we've done a lot of laboratory and greenhouse trials uh, we're kind of stalled out in the field trial aspect of it, but we know that these products can have a big impact on adults. And it would be a nice way to transition um, towards a softer or biorational product for adult control. And there's really no concerns about uh, resistance issues with these products. A hundred years of oils research has never found any cases of resistance. So we do see this product when we spray it in uh, ample water carriers or post-application irrigation. It moves into the insects through their breathing apparatus on the sides, their spiracles, and it seems to break down surface tension. I don't think it's smothering the insect like what we see with greenhouse studies with soft-bodied insects where you basically coat these spiracles and they can't breathe. Uh, I think what it's doing is it's, it's breaking down surface tension, allowing that ample moisture to basically drown the insect from the inside. So those seem to be the conditions that we need uh, to acquire. We also see it move down uh, from the gut. So there could be some feeding of that material as well. We're not sure if this is toxic to the insect or not, but our di dissections can find the product inside the insect for, uh, uh, in lots of different ways. So we're not really quite sure about how this um, 
material is causing mortality and maybe that's not important for you maybe that's just an academic exercise uh, but we do see this with other products that have oil carriers to their formulation so this was a study that was conducted by uh, my former advisor and Albert Koppenhofer at Rutgers um, where they looked at the combination as well as uh, solo applications of Bavaria bassiana which is a fungus um, with a pyrethroid so what we often see is that oils and pyrethroids, when we combine them, they have this synergistic activity. So it could be the breaking down of surface tension that allows that material to move into the insect's body that much easier. I think we're seeing some other things too that I'll touch on as well. What they concluded in their study is, uh, you know, they got this great control with the Bavaria, Bavaria bassiana, but they attribute that control to the oil carrier. So they looked at that component alone and saw that that caused mortality as well. So it might not just be that biological agent doing anything, it could just be the formulation. And that's an area of insect science that we know very little about, uh, all these inert materials, all these formulations, how one product could work uh, with the same active ingredient could work much better than another product just based on how it's formulated. So uh, in the last couple of years, what we've started looking at, uh, similar to the Civitas work, is looking at surfactants or wetting agents. Uh, and wetting agents, you know, I always get the, the question in talks, uh, how do you think a wetting agent would improve this product? And I always say, well, we don't really have those data. Uh, I can't assume that it would make it worse. I think it would probably make it better. I would imagine that it, uh, adding a surfactant to any contact insecticide or any insecticide that we need to deliver down to the roots is just gonna work that much better with a surfactant as it breaks down the surface tension and allows for better, you know, kind of uniformity of that product in an area. But what we are seeing in other studies with other insects in agriculture is that we can see that the inclusion of wetting agents or surfactants to allow that product to get into the insect's body. So these products that we're talking about are nerve toxins. And if we can deliver that into the insect's body better, past this really waxy cuticle that's gonna be repellent to many products, then all of a sudden we delivered it in a higher concentration into the insect's body. But what we're also seeing is some evidence of papers with bed bugs uh, that have become resistant to insecticides where their enzyme activity is just ramped up. And they're chewing through these insecticides, all of a sudden, just the application of the surfactant depresses those detoxifying enzymes. So I think there's really something that's, uh, you know, we've kind of stumbled into kind of in a backwards way. Uh, I guess I'm not that very smart. I should do the reading first and then the study second. But either way, I think it's an exciting new area. So we've screened a lot of surfactants uh, over the last couple of years, and some of them will actually provide direct mortality of adult weevils. And so what we can see here, a lot of data that I'm throwing at you, basically we take quarter rates of a pyrethroid and we apply it with a surfactant and see what kind of mortality we get of adults. And so in the light blue bar is kind of like the increase over the surfactant alone. The dark blue bar would be a unique surfactant from a unique surfactant class. And you can see that they're providing some pretty good mortality on their own. But if you look at something like 1171, we've gone from 50% mortality with the surfactant alone to now 100% mortality with the surfactant. So we're basically at the screening process, trying to understand the different classes of surfactants and how they could possibly work, and then trying to add those into uh, these reduced. Why we use a reduced rate is we wanna see that impact of the surfactant alone. So I think that's really kind of what we're gonna be pigeonholed into for adult control. I think finding adulticides for beetles are going to be very difficult that also meet the requirement of being softer chemistries. It's a big ass to control something as hardy as an insect like that. All right, so uh, as far as larval control options, there are some changes that are uh, coming to the Canadian market as well as US market. I think the biggest um, impacts um, that we can see are going to be in the anthranilic diamides, which uh, in my opinion, are probably the top uses for ABW larvicides uh, or the top larvicides. We could also use uh, nematodes, uh, which is near and dear to my heart, as, and neonics are kind of at that lower rung. We don't see great control with the neonicotinoids. Um, I would probably give clothianidin a, a tip over imidacloprid in that regard. 
But the anthrodelic diamonds are, are what people really want to know about. Um, it seems that we have some new products for Canada that we've had for a while. And, and on the flip side, you've had some things for slightly longer than we've had that are going to hit the market this year. These products have some really unique attributes. The fact that they have systemic uptake means we can put them in the plant. We don't have to worry about scouting. It's a preventive control. It's going to provide some residual activity. Timing is less sensitive. Uh, and at least with the Celeprin, they're virtually non-toxic to pollinators. Um, all of them should be virtually non-toxic to mammals because they work on receptors that we don't have. So there's great attributes with them. The products that we have in the United States, the Celeprin, uh, number one white grub product, as I talked about the caterpillar control, bill bugs as well. There's lots of uses there, but really it is kind of the superior white grub control that we see on the market. Ferrance, on the other hand, is really kind of a niche product here in the United States, and that's annual bluegrass weevil control. Again, I think it's uh, the top larvicide that we have on the market. Now, the new player is Tetrino, and I think we're gonna see a lot of use of it in the United States. Uh, this year, Canada has had it before us, which is awesome. Uh, and so I think probably some of you have uh, a lot of experience with this insecticide. We've been looking at it in, in our trials for several years, so we kind of have a good idea about how it works. In the way that uh, I describe it, I think it is gonna be a niche product. I think all of these anthronyllic diamides have a place in the marketplace. Uh, but Tetrino is coming into kind of a crowded marketplace with these other uh, diamides. And these two diamides that we have work really, really different. We want to understand how Tetrino works as well. So structurally, very similar. And the way that I explain it um, to my clientele is I use sleep medications as an example. So we have two sleep medications here in the U.S., Lunestra and Ambien. Lunestra, have a couple of drinks, go home, sleep no problem. Ambien, I might take an Ambien after I've had a couple of drinks and all of a sudden I'm showing up at work, I'm naked at my desk, or you're out mowing greens in your pajamas, you don't want to do that. It even says it on the label here that uh, some users have reported unexplained sleepwalking, sleep driving, night eating syndrome, I probably have that too to some degree, uh, and performing other daily tasks while asleep. So structurally very similar, but how they behave very, very different. So what we see as far as the differences between a celeprin and ferrets, um, this is a you know what a lot of people ask me is about Syngenta's Weevil Track program, which is these recommendations based on university trials and what we're seeing in the field. And the recommendations are scimitar, which is a pyrethroid, at when against the adults, and we come back with a celeprin, early instars, and then we come in with ferrets for third instar. So that's a very expensive program. It works very very well. But my opinion is that we don't see great control with the celebrant alone. And really that it's in there to control white grub. So it's more of a holistic program. So what we see is Ferenc is excellent activity against annual bluegrass weevil. The celebrant, if you've got a susceptible population, which pretty much nobody has here in the States, uh, you might get some decent control, but it's not something that I typically run. So structurally, very similar but how they work on a target pest, very different based on their attributes. Uh, I would also say that, you know, Ferenc uh, works very well against resistant ABW, and, and, and that's why we see a great adoption of it uh, here in the U.S. So in my opinion, I think pyrethroid plus Ferenc should do a bang-up job for most of our populations. Acelepran, it could be uh, that, that lack of control is due to some resistance issues here in the U.S. So these differences that we see with these three anthronyllic diamides could be related to movement. So again, all three very structurally similar, but how they're gonna move through the plant, how they're gonna uh, provide residual activity is gonna be very different. So ferrets, I think why we see it being such a great annual bluegrass weevil material is it's taken up by the plant and it's gonna accumulate in the crown. And that's right where we want it to be when that insect starts to bite into the plant and then hopefully expire soon after. A celeprin, really, really long residual activity. And that's what makes it different from the other three. It's relatively insoluble. So when we put it in the soil, that plant is able to take it up kind of consistently over a long, long period of time. What we see with Tetrina, as you can see from the bear site here in the US is from the inoculation, and I believe this is radio labeled studies here, you can see it kind of moves outward from its point. 
So getting it down into the soil is going to be as critical as these other uh, anthranoic diamonds. But tetrino is really the one that we don't know in the U.S. because we haven't uh, worked with it in the field or had lots of uh, adoption in the field yet. I think it will be this year. Uh, we can look at its characteristics relative to the other anthranoic diamonds. So these are all the actives that we have in turf in the U.S. And we basically color code these things based on their attributes to see how they compare to something else. So down here at the bottom, class 28, the anthranoic diamides, we can see that its solubility is, is pretty similar to the other anthranoic diamides. Uh, its adsorption is a little bit more of a binder. Uh, than these other anthranolic diamides, but I don't suspect that it's going to behave differently as far as binding. It should have no problem getting it to the soil. The big difference that we see with tetrino is the half-life, you know, how quickly it's going to degrade. So celeprin, this is laboratory study, so take it with a grain of salt. I'm not suggesting that we're going to get three years of white grub control uh, with the celeprin, but the half-life of 228 days to 924 days is pretty impressive. Ference is less than that. And what we see with Tetrino is a half-life of about 130 days. So uh, much, much shorter than the others. So I think timing is gonna be really, really critical with Tetrino for things like ABW, which I think its top, top use is gonna be right before that insect enters the soil. So right at that third instar timing. That's what our data suggests in field trials. I don't think it's a standalone uh, in the U.S. populations. I think in low density populations, it might be okay to get away with, uh, but it's going to be part of a program here in the U.S. The one niche thing that I think really sets Tetrino apart is as a rescue treatment. Now, we think of this class as being preventive insecticides, but what seems to be different with Tetrino is that if we put it down when we're starting to see a little bit of damage, a little bit of yellowing, that early, early damage, uh, it outperformed things like uh, Dialox, which is trichloroform that we have here, which most people use. So, you know, you see these numbers of 35 to 50% control, you say, oh, that's not very good, but that's excellent as far as a, a late rescue treatment. Uh, we don't seem to see that with the other anthranilic diamond. So I think there is that use for it as well. As far as white grubs, you know, that residual activity, I think this really shows in the summary of our white grub trials over the year, we get really good control of white grubs when we time it fairly close to egg hatch. So instead of putting it down in, you know, April or May uh, that we would do with the celeprin, we now have to put it closer to that event. That's happening in about the middle of July for most of our egg laying annual white grubs. So, when we put it down in May in our trials, we don't get any control. June, we start to see some good control at the end of June. So it has enough residual activity, I would suggest, for three to four weeks. July was great, but even in August, we were getting 85% control. So at that time, we have first instars, maybe some early second instars. So all of this data suggests that there is a use for this product, uh, not only preventively, but curatively as well. So the timing is going to be really important. We looked at it in a real extreme example this year. This person had 18 fairways that looked like this, Japanese beetle. Um, so what you can see is our trial area was right here to the left of our trial area. They had applied some tetrino about seven to 10 days earlier. And you can see that's about the only green turf in there. But we applied it against third instars, so really hardy. There were about 40 larvae per square, so like 400 per square meter of white grubs, Japanese beetle in these areas. And what we saw this time is not really great control. So all our other trials where we had looked at first or second instars, we got pretty good curative control. Uh, I think on par with our best curative controls, which we don't have great curatives, but some pretty good curative control of white grubs if they're first or second instars. I would say don't wait until they're third instars. Do all the things that we're supposed to do, like water it in, uh, and take care of it, get it out of the sunlight. The one big question that we have, and hopefully we can solve this one this year, is chinch bug activity. I don't think there's a whole lot of work that's been done on this. We don't see chinch bug activity with the celeprin, or uh, I don't think we see it with ferrets either. The anthranolic diamides are not known to control chinch bug. Uh, I've yet to see any data from uh, chinch activity. I'm a little skeptical of chinch activity. However, this product does seem to have curative activity, so it is entirely possible. This is where neonicotinoids 
usually reign supreme over anthranoic diamides. All right, in my final few minutes, uh, I do want to talk about some biologic control agents. Uh, people always ask me about what I think is promising, whether uh, we see these new fungi coming to the market or bacterial BT products. I really think that the best uh, biocontrol agents that we have for turf are still insect parasitic nematodes. Uh, it's something that we've looked at for a very long period of time. Uh, they have lots of advantages such as rapid kill. Uh, they have these stages that can persist and cause future mortality of insects. And we can put them right in our spray equipment. It's really uh, seems to be the perfect biological control agent for turf. It is a pathogen. It's classified as a pathogen as these uh, roundworms enter the body of the insect and they puke up this bacteria that changes them really cool colors and then they die and then they shatter forth and, and put out uh, new progeny. So really kind of an interesting kind of heat sinking missile, if you will, of a biocontrol agent. I think uh, what we see in the US is that our biggest hurdles are in QC. So our quality control and production is really lagging. I think Canada, much, much better situation. I would be much more apt to take a risk on commercial nematode products. Uh, people here refer to them as sea monkeys. So if you're between the ages of 45 and 60, like I am, uh, you probably remember sea monkeys in the back of comic books uh, where you have this underworld kingdom where you sprinkle this thing in your fish tank and there's all these creatures living that you can't see. Uh, we bought a bunch of nematodes in the U.S. this year, and pretty much all of them were dead on arrival. Uh, and so I think those are the hurdles that we have here in the U.S. We have looked at trying to make applications of nematodes better, but what we can see is that inherently nematodes die off very rapidly after we make that application. So instead of this recycling idea, I think we really need to think about nematodes as being contact insecticides, if you will. I mean, they rapidly decay after we make those applications. And what we also see is in a turf situation that we think would be perfect for nematodes that we can water, they kind of break down spatially as well. They kind of go into these segregates uh, over time. So what we've looked at is going back to surfactants again, is trying to make um, these organisms be able to move through the turf environment a little bit better, uh, have some retention of moisture in those uh, soils that they can move because they require moisture to move. Uh, and in this case, what we can see is we've applied different nematode and surfactant combinations to this turf, and then we just shut the water off. So it was a very, very severe uh, kind of study to see if you know the application of the surfactant would improve their survivability. And unfortunately, you know, it looked good. Uh, the turf was definitely improved with surfactants. I'm a big surfactant fan now. But if we looked at this really fine detailed scale of these organisms, what we see is that it just pretty much looks the same as untreated versus uh, treated with a, a surfactant is they kind of break down into these isolated areas. So if they break down into an area where that pest isn't there, uh, then, you know, you're not going to have a big impact of that nematode. So it could have been too extreme. It could have been too late. I would say probably preloading the system, applying these surfactants ahead of time uh, would be better. Our final thing too is, you know, we've had lots of people ask, are, you know, are surfactants actually hurting nematodes? Are they incompatible? Uh, if you think about them, some of them are kind of like soaps. Uh, and you would think that that would be really traumatic to a nematode. So what we've done is we've looked at a, a four class or three classes of surfactants in a really extreme situations, just in plates that don't get any oxygen, they're not being agitated, really not great for life. And we're seeing whether or not um, they are sticks or these dead ones uh, or viable, these kind of curly ones that move back and forth. So very, very simple study. If we add these things in water and hold them for a long period of time, which is not gonna happen in the field, do they eventually die off? And the short answer is, when we add them at first, we saw less viability than adding them to straight water alone. But over time, really after 24 to 96 hours, we really don't see any difference. In fact, uh, we actually had better survivability in these plates with surfactants in the water alone, but they all steadily kind of decline. So it could initially have some issues, but that's a really extreme example of uh, kind of 
uh, holding a nematode into a SOPI solution, if you will. So, you know, that's kind of my world when I think I'm right at the time limit here, but, you know, my parting thoughts is really what does the future hold? I do think we're going to see some more restrictions and losses, and that's going to lead to some damage in the short term. But I do think the future is bright as far as what our industry partners are bringing as far as lower risk insecticides to the market. And I also think, uh, and we look to you in Canada for being the leaders there, but uh, the alternatives, biological controls. Unfortunately, we have to wade through a lot of products that are, are kind of iffy, and that's where we need testing and, and really thorough evaluation of these products. So with that, uh, thank you, Nigel. Thank you all, Turf. Uh, and definitely, I'd like to thank the people who make me look good, uh, like my lab mates. Wonderful presentation, Ben. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you do such a great job with your talks, and, and there really doesn't leave a lot of room for extra questions to my mind because you just seem to go on just the right amount of time to expand on the topic enough to cover some. Uh, there were a couple that did come in, though. Uh, we've got a couple minutes with you. Maybe you can answer one or Absolutely. two questions for us. Go uh, for it. And, it. and we've got a wonderful participation here. We've got over 270 people on the webinar today. That's and, great. Uh, we're great to see these people from all over parts of Canada at the moment. So uh, first question was, uh, you mentioned pesticide failure in the south with regard to fall armyworm. Um, what did you tie that to? Poor application timing, poor product efficacy, uh, lack of control options? Is there something specific you can talk about there for a second? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, this is anecdotal. So there, I think people are looking into this. Uh, my colleague at Auburn University in Alabama, you know, that's where they're going to have almost continuous generation per year. Uh, he's hypothesizing that we're starting to see some pyrethroid resistance. And so, for example, you could apply a celeprin in turf for $120 per acre in the U.S., or you could make a generic pyrethroid application for $3 per acre. So I think to the southern farmer, maybe they say, hey, I can make 40 applications for the same price. So uh, this repeat, it, it's very difficult. I mean, I think one preventive measure would probably uh, suffice in the south, maybe two applications, which seems extreme. Um, but there's lots of areas for these insects to persist, and there's lots of different management practices going on. They also attack corn. So those uh, farmers are not probably um, going the extra mile as far as cost there. So I think it's this m consistent application of these products. I think that's a very likely hypothesis. Comes back to economics, not, not an uncommon thing. Um, second question was uh, with regard to Civitas applications. Uh, you've talked about the ABW results. Uh, do you see any efficacy on other insects as well? Uh, I mean, I think it would stand to reason that you could get above ground insects like that. I think, um, you know, in the field, we we get great data in laboratory and greenhouse. And, and once we get to the field level, it's a little bit, I think it's just harder to prove the concept because these insects wander away and we can't really corral them in an area. So that's part of it. Uh, but I, I would say like probably bill bugs, which are going to be less of an issue in Canada, I think black turf grass atenias, those of you might have them in bent grass or even poa greens, uh, very similar to ABW uh, in the fact that they're going to be cruising along the surface. Uh, chinch bugs would be one that I could see yes or no if we have a whole bunch of the stages overlapping at a time where we have eggs, those are probably going to, you know, the product would break down and then they'd hatch out. So I could see that being a little less. But the, this is entirely spitballing, Nigel. This is entirely spitballing. Uh, I would say anything above ground. Great. The spitballing we usually do over beer in a uh, table at the pub, but uh, we'll have to make an exception. To that. I know. I know. You, you mentioned you're going to the UK, and this is a question, I think, from the UK. Um, do you think the wetter, milder winters are key reason they're seeing European crane fly, fly increases? Or is a more delayed effect of taking away controls and populations have increased to critical levels or both? That's a great question. I think uh, the questioner <laughs> hit it on both angles. I think it's the loss of products, so basically uncontrolled. I think the real extreme rainfall. Um, so in the places that it, and it's similar to our areas here uh, as far as the amount of annual rainfall that they get. Uh, 
I think the big difference that we see in the UK is where they attack versus where they attack here. So in Canada, in the US, we might get the occasional green damage underneath a cover, uh, but that seems to be area number one in the UK that, that, that we're seeing populations in greens. So I do think environment's a big one. Uh, we see major population crashes when we don't have that ample rainfall. Uh, I think they're going through a couple of years of some pretty intense rainfall coupled with the loss of products. Fantastic. Uh, one final question. You talked about the uh, helpfulness of wetting agents making a insecticide work a little better. Um, any tips? We, we, we have so many different wetting agents and a lot of them have different uh, application guidelines. Any tips uh, in a general sense on creating that mixture and, and not getting yourself into trouble with uh, phyto or, or you know something coming back to bite you? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what we're really trying to wrap our arms around right now is that we see, uh, and I like to work in kind of uh, a blind situation where I have people give me products or where I don't know what they are, and then we screen them so that there's absolutely no bias whatsoever. Uh, and so right now I'm, I'm screening compounds and then we kind of promote it to the next level based on the activity. And so my cooperators, you know, we found some things that work very well against insects. And then we'll say, we want to look at this in level two screening. And they say, well, that will burn turf. And then I say, why did you give that to me? So there is always that concern with the surfactant. Um, what we're trying to do in our lab is really kind of remove like the marketing about surfactants and just look at how they perform. Um, so maybe we should take them first and spray them on turf and then eliminate them that way. Uh, some of our older surfactants, when we first started uh, doing this work, really were harsh on the turf uh, and did cause burn. Uh, so they were quickly eliminated. So uh, unfortunately, some of the hotter things do look pretty good on insects. So it's just about kind of wrapping our arms around what these different classes actually do and really sitting with chemists and saying, how is this, how would you expect this to behave? We can do this with insecticides. I could showed in the presentation take these attributes this is how it's going to behave and uh you know i was a chemistry major but that didn't last very long in college <laughs> folks are more fun <laughs> ben thanks very much uh it's always a great presentation thank you for the support from syngenta uh, our friends there with matt leg and, and dale and and uh, uh mr white and, and colin all those folks down there are great um just a quick reminder for our attendees this morning uh,